I got my Christmas lights all on. I'm going to go ahead and call this meeting to order. Right. Any motions to direct the city manager to add agenda items? Thank you, Mayor Bagley, for remembering that I asked for a moment. I'm, this is not a motion to direct staff. Tomorrow is the 80th birthday of one of our senior uh, elder leaders in Longmont, John Shetter, uh, who came, arrived in Longmont in 1971 with his bride, his bride, Bev. He's a friend of the senior center. He's a He's a storyteller volunteer in the school district. He is the epitome of a servant leader. And so for John's 80th birthday tomorrow, I want to offer a birthday limerick. John, John Shetter, we all know, is real smart. For Longmont, he is shirt on his part. So on this birthday, we just want to say we love him for the size of his heart. Thank you, Mayor Bagley. No, th thank you. Councilmember Christensen. I thanks for that limerick. I think that was a very nice way to greet him for his birthday. It has occurred to me we had the uh, the Arapaho Northern Arapaho came down, and only two members of City Council were able to actually be there, and the rest of us really couldn't hear what was going on. Given how um, how devastating COVID has been. To particularly to uh, First Nations people. I think it would be appropriate if uh, our staff reached out to the Northern Arapaho to ask them if it would be helpful to them to have say a $5,000 donation to their hospital or some other um, thing that would be helpful for them in this time. I uh, love that idea. Okay. Is that a motion? Yeah, I guess it's a motion to direct staff to do that. I'll second it have staff reach out to, uh, uh, to the leaders, I presume Lee Spoon Hunter uh, of the Northern Rappo tribe and discuss with them their, their needs such as maybe a monetary donation to their hospital. In favor say aye. 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 Opposed say nay. All right, the motion carries unanimously. And, all right, let's go ahead and move on to the update on COVID-19. Mayor, um, Council, we actually have Jeff Zayak from Boulder County Health here tonight to, to present. Thanks, Harold. Thanks, Council members. It's a pleasure to be back. So this is the current incidence rate on the state public health dial. Uh, and this is our positivity rate. Um, and our, our current positivity rate in Boulder County is 6.7%. We have a large amount of testing that's occurring. I'll show you that on a slide as we move forward. The current number of days of e decreasing or stable hospitalizations Currently, we are in the yellow, and this is declining in a positive trend, as I'll show you when we look at our specific data. This is the graph that we typically share with you. It's the Metro Denny, Denver County um, COVID-19 new case rates, and it's a seven-day moving average. We have the second lowest number of new cases across the metro. Again, this is the total number of positives, and then the total number of positives associated with long-term care facilities. Uh, biggest challenges with deaths, and they still are uh, to this day, have been in long-term care facilities. And that's because long-term care facilities are congregate care facilities. Um, and we know that once the disease is in uh, the facility, it's difficult to control the spread of the disease. And this just shows our five-day average new case rate. Um, we're very happy to see it continue to go down. This just shows the, the relative contribution from each of our municipalities municipalities that have uh, positive tests. You, this shows um, the breakdown of residents testing positive or who are considered probable by race and ethnicity by week. And you can see that one of our biggest challenges here is um, the disparity and inequity that we have in the number of Hispanic Latinx population that currently is positive. Um, and we know that this is an area that we need to continue to focus on. I wanna give uh, a thank you to Longmont for working in partnership with us to think about how we can best engage um, this community in decision-making and help us think about the best way to make a difference within that population. Um, so thank you again to Longmont here. This is the total number of tests and the total number of tests that are positive. This is our five-day positivity rate, and this is different than the one that you saw on the dial. The reason we check that we track five days because we can see changes more quickly. This is our hospitalizations. This is a very good trend to see, obviously. And I want to give a shout out here to anybody who's listening to say that um, please take time to to thank healthcare workers. They're, they put themselves out there every single day uh, to treat these folks who show up in the hospital that are coming 
in from our community and do the best they can to care for them. We're not approaching surge uh, crisis, especially for our medical beds. Um, what we are challenged with uh, is, our, is our ability again to make sure that hospitals have the staffing they need to be able to take care of the beds uh, that they do need uh, to be able to treat patients. This is the state hospitalization. And as you can see, um, we've got a decline there. This is the number of deaths. Unfortunately, um, uh, what we've had is we've had 35 deaths in November um, and 14 deaths already in December. This is just a graph of flu versus COVID versus hospitalizations. Um, this is the social distancing uh, that you've heard me talk about before. And Boulder County right now is at 54% social distancing. This shows lapses in control. This is statewide um, current transmission control, um, which is what the TC is. So just to summarize, we still have an estimated one in 40 people statewide. This was this prediction was as of this Saturday. They'll update this prediction again at the end of this week. But we still have one in 40 people statewide who are infectious with COVID-19. And finally, there is definitely light at the end of the tunnel. Um, we do have some hope with the vaccine. The vaccine has a high effectiveness, which is very, um, which is very encouraging. Next, let's go ahead with the Front Range Passenger Rail presentation. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, members of Council. Phil Greenwald, Transportation Planning Manager with the City of Longmont. Just wanted to uh, quickly get to the Front Range Passenger Rail um, presentation here by Randy Grauberger. I appreciated Phil uh, inviting me quite a while back um, and uh, told him we're always uh, anxious to get the word out about Front Range Passenger Rail. So. Uh, thank you for this opportunity. Okay, Southwest Chief and Front Range Passenger Rail Commission. I'm the I'm Randy Grauberger, and I am the project director for the commission. These are the 11 voting members, uh, and we have three non-voting members. These are the commission's purposes for existing. Basically, again, that legislation in 2017 will preserve Southwest Chief service in the southern part of the state. The facilitation of the development of Front Range Passenger Rail. The legislation called for Front Range Passenger Rail to exist between Pueblo and Fort Collins. And there have been studies done for many, many years up and down the Front Range and across the state for passenger rail. But the real reason that it really makes sense now is the incredible population changes. Here's some of the reasons that the commission was charged with implementing Front Range Passenger Rail. We're pretty concerned about the, the average travel time. We did an online public meeting uh, a survey that was up 24 seven for the entire month of July, this past July. 10,000 people responded to the overall survey. Where would you most want the alignment of Front Range Rail to go? And, and what would be your most primary purpose for using Front Range Passenger Rail? Where do you most wanna go? And again, there's no surprises. It's the, the predominant uh, destinations and, and attractions, Denver, the airport, Colorado Springs, Fort Collins, Boulder, and, and on down the line. The modeling that we've been doing projects that a, there'll be a very notable demand for, for this service. Uh, this is the, uh, the ridership numbers for one of three alignments that we uh, still have in contention. And one of those happens to run right down through the middle of Longmont, the BNSF line. These are the alignments that are still in contention as we're wrapping up this first consultant contract. Uh, we've got two lines. The, the blue line is the BNSF line that I mentioned that goes through Longmont. Uh, the yellow line is actually the line that we evaluated back in 2014. The purple line uh, is the I-25 corridor alignment. That one does not penetrate downtown Denver, but instead when it hits the north suburban and, and south suburban areas, it heads east out to the airport in the I or the E-470 corridor. We think that Front Range Passenger Rail has an incredible amount of momentum uh, been developed over the past 15 months. So I would move that as a council, we draft that um, staff draft a letter in uh, letters to our senators and representatives and also to our state representatives uh, in support of this in support of this program. I'll second that. We should also add on their RTD. Yes. Um, Along with uh, RTD, do you think, and I'm not sure, do you think we should add our lobbyists on there as well? I think what's best is Phil could just come up with a list and get the letter to him. So uh, basically the motion is to uh, write our, our uh, elected representatives at all levels, 
expressing our support of of the uh, Southwest Chief slash Front Range Rail. Um, all in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed, say nay. All right, the motion carries unanimously. Update on the 219 Greenhouse Gas Inventory and Climate Action Task Force recommendations. Well. I'm Lisa Nabok, Sustainability Program Manager with Public Works and Natural Resources. The 2019 Greenhouse Gas Inventory. And then we'll be discussing the evaluation and prioritization of the Climate Action Task Force recommendations. And then finally, the Solar Feasibility Study. And then we'll be discussing the evaluation and prioritization of the Climate Action Task Force recommendations. And then finally, the Solar Feasibility Study. Uh, which was first conceived by wastewater treatment staff to offset peak loading and then was expanded to look at all public, publicly owned properties in Longmont. So I really just want to acknowledge those folks at the wastewater treatment plant uh, for taking that initiative. So I'm Francie Jaffe, Water Conservation and Sustainability Specialist. So I'm going to start off my presentation with the update to the 2019 Greenhouse Gas Inventory. Next. As a reminder, the sustainability plan directs city staff to update the inventory every three years from a 2016 baseline. Um, the city uses the internationally recognized GBC protocol to determine our greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, the GPC protocol uses the unit metric tons carbon dioxide equivalent. This combines carbon dioxide, methane, and nitrous oxides, three greenhouse gas emissions into one unit. For context, one metric ton of carbon dioxide equivalent is about 113 gallons of gasoline. So this is a overview of the 2019 emissions by sector. Our um, largest sector is residential commercial electricity followed by commercial and residential natural gas. So this is the same pie chart, but we're bringing in additional equity share emissions. That additional equity share emissions represents the percentage that the city of Longmont owns of what Platte River Power Authority is selling on the market. When comparing 2016 to 2019, we saw a 8% decrease in total emissions and a 12% increase in per capita. When looking at waste, it's important to look at the full life cycle of a product from a raw material to manufacturing to the transportation it goes through to whether it's recycled, composted, or put in the landfill. And what we found was that in 2019, we avoided uh, just under 56,000 metric tons of carbon dioxide equivalent. So we wanted to see the impact of what if we increased our waste diversion. I'm not going to highlight um, strategies to increase our waste diversion in too much depth as that was a main um, effort of Bob Allen's Waste Services Update presentation last week. When doing this analysis, we found that the city of Longmont only hauls about 33 percent of the total waste um, for the entire city. So if we want to work toward these waste diversion goals, uh, we need to work with all haulers, not just the city, to achieve those greenhouse gas emission reductions. The next presentation will be the evaluation of the Climate Action Task Force recommendations, which was requested by City Council on August 25th. There's a lot of text and I'm not expecting to, you to read all of this, but the reason I'm bringing this all up is because I wanted to remind City Council of the breadth and scope of the 27 Climate Action Task Force recommendations. To evaluate the recommendations, staff looked at seven different criteria, criteria ranging from cost to community impact and board feedback. I want to walk through how we use the weighting scenario process. I do want to note that this ranking doesn't mean you need to do uh, recommendations ranked one first and then recommendations ranked second next and then down the list. Um, this was just a tool combined with staff modifications to help staff determine when the recommendations should be implemented. So this is for the water conservation recommendation. This recommendation was consistently ranked last across the different weighting scenarios. In the proposed staff modification that's detailed in the packet, staff is instead recommending that we continue with current water conservation and drought management efforts, which includes a recent um, effort to better integrate water efficiency and land use planning until 2024 for the next water efficiency master plan update. I wanted to next highlight the 12 proposed near-term recommendations. The ones that are highlighted in yellow at the top are already budgeted for 2021. So our request to City Council this evening is to approve staff's recommendations of proposed near-term 
midterm and monitor over time actions, including the proposed modifications to the recommendations and direct staff to continue working on these efforts, as well as integrate this work into the next sustainability plan in Envision Longmont. I am going to move that the council adopts uh, the plans, uh, the staff's implementation plan for the Climate Action Task Force recommendations uh, as it stands. Second. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed say nay. All right, the motion carries unanimously. Congratulations, Councilmember Martin. I know that was important to you. Councilmember Peck. I would just like to thank uh, the whole task force for all the work they've done on this. I know as we go through each segment of all these recommendations, we're going to be hitting on the body of work. So um, everybody that was involved with that, I thank you. Tim, are you up for the solar feasibility study? Yes, I am. My name is Tim Ellis. I'm the Renewable Energy Strategy Manager in the Energy Strategies and Solutions Group at LPC. I'm here tonight with Dan Shippey, who is a control systems electrician in Public Works and Natural Resources. Uh, and we're gonna present the results of a solar feasibility study that was completed a few months ago. Uh, so here's our agenda for the presentation. First, we're gonna review the purpose and methodology of the study. The Longmont Sustainability Plan provides a roadmap for social, environmental, and economic progress for the city. This solar feasibility study addresses the plan's actions to expand the use of renewable energy technologies to improve environmental quality. So here are the selection parameters that we use to evaluate the 31 sites and pare down the list to the top eight. So this table lists the final eight sites ranked by the sustainability and life cycle cost tools as they relate to each other. And next, Dan's gonna present uh, a, a few slides that are overviews of each of the eight sites that we selected. As Tim mentioned, there are eight sites that I'll discuss in more detail. Um, they consist of a wide variety of system types as well. Site one is the newly constructed renewable natural gas waste services building on South Martin Street. Site two is the newly constructed maintenance office building at the wastewater treatment plant. Site three is the pavilion at Roosevelt Park and is sized at 87 kilowatts. Site five is a rooftop mount system on building seven of Public Works O&M vehicle storage on Airport Road. And here we have sites four and six. Both are located at Centennial Pool. Site seven is the Nelson Flanders water treatment plant. Site eight is a 138 kilowatt design installed over the wastewater treatment plant's primary clarifier covers. Um, and in 2018, the city of Longmont committed to reach 100% renewable energy by 2030. The next year, the city declared a climate emergency with the intent to take actions to address the climate crisis. There are also plans and studies underway by our wholesale provider, Platte River Power Authority, that together with this study will help us determine ways to reach 100% renewable. What I, my question is simply, theoretically, by being part of the PRPA co-op, aren't they doing it anyway? Platte River Power Authority is aware that to reach the goals that they are honestly struggling with, that we have set them, that distributed energy resources are necessary by the cities. They have a distributed energy resource task force. Our own David Hornbacker is the chair of the distributed energy resource task force, I do believe. And the immediate good of solarization in Longmont um, is peak shaving. I, I really don't agree that honestly that, that this project goes against uh, PRPA's goals in any way at all. They're happy to have us doing this. All right, let's go on. Building energy benchmarking update. Welcome Debbie. Good evening. I'm Mayor Bagley and members of city council. My name is Debbie Seidman. And I work for Longmont Power and Communications. I'm an engineer and project manager uh, by background. I currently work in the Energy Strategies and Solutions Group. I am here to provide an update on what we have accomplished in 2030. So for the agenda today is I will provide a, um, I'll reintroduce benchmarking. I'll give you information about a demonstration project that we held in 2020 and provide information about a larger voluntary program that we plan to move to in 2021. We use an EPA software and receive um, an ENERGY STAR score. Uh, the intent is to make building owners aware of their energy use 
and then to take additional action to improve their score. And nationally, there are 34 cities that currently have a building energy benchmarking ordinance. Ordinance, there are also three states that have a requirement. We did recruit 10 commercial buildings to participate and a subset of those are shown here. Um, the school district participated with two buildings. Um, Honda, North America Data Center participated. Circle Graphics, a large manufacturing company, um, participated as well as the First Bank building on North Main. They receive a score, again, here's an example of a building receiving a score of 60, and this is again on a scale of one to 100. We also, as I mentioned, had some formal and informal customer feedback. So here's the results of the 10 um, commercial buildings that participated. If a building has a score of 75 or greater, they are eligible to become an Energy Star certified building. So we also, um, benchmark 10 municipal buildings. I worked on those and I worked with facilities management in the city and I worked with uh, many department managers located at various buildings throughout the city to obtain the information I needed to input into the software. Here's results from the municipal buildings. As an example, we have a score of 60 for the Development Services Center. I was surprised considering that's an older building that it had such a good score. I assumed it, it just wouldn't have, uh, I, I just, in general, the newer buildings tend to score higher. With these initial programs, we can provide a lot of really um, good education and support with our customers. Um, now, as I mentioned in 2021, we'd like to expand this program to all commercial buildings of the same size, 20,000 square foot and greater. We have approximately 280 buildings in Longman of this size. Current actions and um, near-term actions. Again, we had a demonstration project in 2020. We're still consolidating feedback. Uh, we will move to this voluntary program in 2021. Then we do plan to come back to city council and report um, our findings from 2021. All right. Thank you very much. We appreciate Thank you. that. We uh, have mayor and council comments, anybody? No comments for you, mayor. All right, great. Do we have a motion to adjourn? So move. See you guys next week. We're adjourned.